And we know via the price mechanism that if price, for example, if, if for example, the argument would be, if there is a surplus of goods here, here, this is a surplus, right? This is the surplus of goods here. Quantity demand is greater than quantity supply. The price falls. The price in the marketplace left on its own devices. The market will adjust until the quantity demand equals the quantity supply, given you know, the demand and supply functions, etc. <clears throat> so like the simple questions. Does Brooks sell everything they produce? Yes, they do. They sell most of the stuff in their store at a certain price. They have a sell summer sale if they can't sell it all. And then it goes to the warehouse or something where it goes at a lower price. And then it goes to the um, clearance center where it all sells. Right? Everything Roots produces sells. And then the market adjusts. And ultimately, with a properly functioning market, Roots will produce exactly the quantity supplied that equals the quantity demand. And the prices will adjust. Right? This is the competitive market. This is the price mechanism we've been talking about. Apply it to the society as a whole. What about labor? Well, we've talked about labor already. So this is the price of labor. Uh, of labor right here, right? Which is the wage. This is the quantity of labor down here, right? This is the quantity. Also, the interest rate, as we're going to see subsequently, adjusts. So there's no surplus of capital or shortage of capital. <clears throat> now, it turns out that's the main idea. That idea absolutely prevails before 1936. Amongst the vast majority of economists, someone like Marx and all these exceptions. But basically, the idea is that markets do their thing. Leave them alone and they'll correct themselves. There'll be full employment. There'll be maximum investment the whole bit. Now it turns out, as we're going to see subsequently, economists, Marx for one, but another guy named Jevons, both of these very famous in the history of economics, obviously. By the 18th, and even John Stuart Mill, to a certain extent, writing in the 1940s, Marx in the 60s, Jevons in the 70s, all said they observed a phenomenon that there are periods of unemployment. There are periods of unemployment. They didn't know what it was. Jevons actually tried to say that unemployment was caused by sunspots, which affected harvests, which caused <laughs> unemployment. Marx had other explanations, and Mill just noticed it. I'll talk a little bit more about it. But the point is this. People noticed, even from by, before 1800, they noticed periods of unemployment. But before 1800, they thought it was caused maybe by fluctuations in the weather and harvest and this and that. But they asked, but they, they asked themselves this question. And basically they all answered, it must be that in competition there is that the market corrects itself. Right? Now this is the fundamental idea. I can't stress this enough. This is what the whole macro course is about. This issue, is there unemployment in a, in a, in a uh, market economy? And you might say, of course there is. I know I've seen people unemployed. But the question is, are they unemployed because 
they, you know, the market is maybe not operating properly. For example, governments are interfering through minimum wage laws, through um, uh, unemployment insurance, through unions. Is this preventing the market from correcting itself? Or is there something wrong with the market? So I'm going to see before 1936, this is the standard line. Now, people that observed that there was unemployment, they'd also observed that what you, you see periods when it seems that there's too many goods produced. That, you know, for example, in the housing market in Toronto, which I'm just waiting at pins and needles for it to collapse because I definitely want to buy a cheap place. Um, right now, in the Toronto market, condos are still selling. But there's like, you know, those 55,000 condos built this year. In the last five years, as I probably mentioned before, more condos built in Toronto than New York, LA, and Chicago all together by a long shot. They're just built and built. Right now, nobody knows prices are going up. Prices are going up. But what people observed in the past was that at some point in first markets, for the mar maybe a specific market like this one, or maybe all sorts of markets all together with this economy as a whole, suddenly, as if by magic, the prices start going up. And you can't sell condos. And there's too many condos. There seems to be, almost overnight, a glut of condos. That's the term that they would use, a glut. You, you go to sell your goods and they can't sell. There's, like in 2008, there was too many cars. You couldn't sell cars. Toyotas were piling up on the California coast. And an unbelievable, you know, thousands of them. They had nowhere to put them. So, so this is what people observe. It's suddenly this happens. So the question is, well, it seems that there's, there's not enough money or something to buy these cars. So that's the debate. Is there or isn't there? And the argument, we're going to start subsequently with Say's Law. I'm not going to do it today, but when I get into things theoretically, mainstream economics says there's always enough income to buy everything, and the price mechanism means that everything sells. That's the fundamental idea. We'll re revisit that. Okay, but in these periods of unemployment, and there are some significant ones, and I'll point out to you a little of the history of it, people saw that there was unemployment, but they assumed it corrected itself, just like in this room. When you guys graduate, you're all going to get a job. You're all going to want a job at 70, 80,000, or whatever, right? But you're not going to get that job necessarily. You're going to get a job, if there's, enough, if there's no jobs to be had, you might get a job at $30,000. If suddenly there's, you know, there's nobody with your skills and there's certain jobs, you might get a job for 80000 But guess what? Everyone in this room is going to get a job after they graduate, one way or another. You might end up as a secretary or a street cleaner, but you're going to get a job. We know that. How is that going to happen? Because you're going to adjust your wages. You're going to lower your wage until you get a job. So in a sense, you're not going to have unemployment in this class. Or is that true? That's the question, that everybody who lowers their wage, can they get a job? And the, the argument Keynes made, someone we're going to talk about subsequently, is that actually there are circumstances when people lowered their wage and they just couldn't get a job. Where they graduated, like for example in the US in the last five years, graduates from universities would, would work for $20,000 and they can't get a job, nothing, right? That's it. They could get a job sweeping the streets. If they can get that, they'd be glad to get it, right? So. <clears throat> That is our issue, um, and I'll talk a little bit about more the evidence for unemployment. But it, even up until 1929, even though there's significant evidence for unemployment and, and periodic unemployment, it's astounding. Everybody denied that there was such that unemployment was a feature of market economies until the Great Depression. So basically, the argument is this: in the classical, neoclassical, I say classical. Before, from 1776 to 1870, neoclassical, basically 1870 to 1930. <clears throat> Before 1930, the argument is market economies go to full employment. That's it. Unemployment corrects itself by a change in wages unless something happens. We'll talk subsequently about it. But for the most part, if, the, if people will lower their wage, they will get a job. Well, in the Great Depression, in the first year, 1929, Wages fell something like 5%, and there was like 8% of people, the unemployment went to 8% from about 2%. In the next year, wages fell by another 10% or so, and unemployment went to 15%. Then the next year, it fell by another 10%, and unemployment went to 20%. And the next year, it fell by another 10%, and unemployment went to 25%. So wages fell, 
and people didn't get jobs. Contradiction. Right? Not only that, you know, so when we talk about recessions and depressions, if we're talking like a depression, there's really only been one, I would say, the Great Depression, and it's almost unique. But basically, the market economy, the competitive market economy, the capitalist commodity, capitalist world flat out collapsed between 1929 and 1933. Nobody could figure out how people could be employed again. Now, as we're going to see, a thing to understand is this. When Canada says we have 7% unemployment, that means, uh, you know, 7% of the population was unemployed for one year, right? 7% unemployment for a year. But basically the population, you know, at the average length of unemployment is about four months. Some people one month, two months. Some people six months or more. But the average length of unemployment is about four months, which means when unemployment is 7%, something like, and that's what Canada is right now, right in Canada right now, we can expect that 21% of Canadians were unemployed this year. When we had like almost, when we had 13% of unemployment in 1982, as I'll show you such they meant. 40% of Canadians were unemployed for about four months, because the average length of unemployment was four months. 40% of Canadians were unemployed for a period of time. And as you'll soon find out when you're working, unless you're wealthy, we're talking about like two or three percent of the population, even people with significant incomes, you go one or two months without income and everything starts falling apart. You can't need mortgage payments, you can't do this, you can't do that. Everything gets wiped out, right? So, Basically, you can't be unemployed for three or four months without losing all the fat. It's like going like from a, not eating for four weeks, months. Not easy to do, right? So, and in the Great Depression, 25% of unemployment meant 75% of the people were unemployed for about four months in that period, which is a disaster, right? Okay, so that's the issue. And out of that, I think of the Great Depression as like the, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, the asteroid hitting the Earth 63 million years ago, which killed off the dinosaurs, because it just, this, the depression just blew economics apart. Because everybody went, wait a minute, this can't be right. The market economy is not correcting itself. And in that period of time in the 30s, there's all sorts of arguments. The one we're going to look at mainly is the one by Keynes, K-E-Y-N-E-S, who argued as a certain argument, the guy was extremely capable economist and kind of pulled it together in a way that was both novel and penetrating. People in 1936 who couldn't under, the world was falling apart. In 1936 there's people who like heard Keynes' theory and they were just staggering around going, oh my God, you know, this is it, this explains it. And the world became Keynesian. Basically, like basically he, he, he argued an explanation of why market economies don't work. Now we say, this is what makes the Keynesian approach so astounding, but we'll talk more about it. In the history of scientific advances, think of like uh, natural selection with Darwin, uh, Copernicus, the Earth revolves around the sun rather than otherwise. All these great scientific inventions are like insights. We know that it takes the profession alone, I'm not talking about the, 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 the um, person on the street, 20 years to get into it. And we basically know that when you make a breakthrough like Darwin did, basically it takes 20 years for the old folks to die. That's it. they got to die. Because they're never going to understand this. And then it comes through. You know, even the most fabulous, like Newton, un interpretations of the understandings of physics, etc., simply took, nobody believed it for like, it didn't dominate even the profession for 20 years. In economics, uh, Keynes came out with his idea in 1936. And it turns out, the rest of the 1930s isn't much of an improvement, as we'll talk about, by, you know, there's a, the, the low point, 25% unemployment in 1933, the economy began to expand, but even in 1938, there's still 17% of the economy unemployed in the United States and Canada, for example, but also in Europe. So, it's still a total disaster. But people are starting to see, ooh, they're doing things that Keynes was suggesting even in the early 30s, but Keynes kind of theoretically put them together for them. And then they still couldn't figure it out until World War II, which just destroyed the world. And at the end of World War II, full employment, basically, in the countries like Canada and the United States. Of course, Europe was wrecked, and parts of Asia. But the thing is, 
basically by 1944, Canada has this honor as the first country to say, we're going to adopt Keynesian principles after the war. What that means is simply this. The government will intervene in the economy to make sure there's full employment. That's the thing. That's what Keynes is all about. And also, in this sense, the government intervenes basically in potentially three ways. The way that Keynes most talked about was changing interest rates. And we're going to discuss that. The way that people think Keynes talked about was government spending, but he definitely talked about that under certain circumstances, and cutting taxes. Those are the three ways. Now, you know, we're going to, when we're, we enter this world, we're going to enter the world of really understanding what the whole macro economy is about, what the Federal Reserve in the U.S. is doing, what the Bank of Canada is doing, what the Prime Minister says about this, what the world is doing, all this stuff to see how you get out of a recession. Now, it turns out, so this is Keynes' position in 1944, a scan eight years after, basically everybody jumps on the, on the, on the bandwagon. And from 1945 to 1975, the world is Keynesian. But in that period, there's a complete backlash of the classical market economy types who come back under the guise of monetarism, we'll talk a little bit about that, who basically say, no, 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 no. Keynes says that the Great Depression was caused by a failure of the market. And they say, no, 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 no. The Great Depression was caused by a failure of the government. The government did some screwed up, and I'll tell you what it is subsequently. This, you know, there's, there might be some argument by these guys. There might be their argument, we'll see, has some validity. But their explanation of Great Depression for me is the most laughable thing I've ever heard. It's literally laughable. But by the way, 80% of US economies take, take this position. 80% of US economists, not European economists, they kind of think it's a joke. But most would take a position. We'll talk about it later. But essentially, by 1975, there's inflation. In the 60s, there's inflation, and inflation is linked to governments interfering in the marketplace, either through deficit spending or printing money. And governments are blamed for the problems of the 1970s, and they're also blamed, by the way, for the problems of the 30s. So by 1975, it's over. Keynes is dead. And we're back to market economy activities, and which prevails from 1975 to probably 2005. And as I say, because like, I'm into being more keen, definitely Keynes in, because I'm into business cycles. This is what really matters to me. I'm very much excited about business cycles. And I think that they are a function of market economies, and I think the governments have to do something to get out of there. So, for example, in 2005, I can't give a paper anywhere. I couldn't speak to anybody because they'd say, what a joke, Keynes is nowhere. The market economies are going to correct. Of course, in 2008, you have the worst recession in the U.S. since World War II, so bad that people were literally freaked out in ways that we'll talk about. Like, I mean, when you see what Bush and Obama did, you just go, oh, my God. They were frightened that the world had fallen apart around them. But six months before, everybody thought it was perfect. You know, and this is the way it is. The day, you, you probably saw in the New York Times last week, we didn't probably, but there's a thing about the Toronto real estate market. And again, there's people going to be saying, hey, the market looks good. Don't worry about it. There's going to be a soft landing. If, there's a, if we're overbuilt, you know, prices will just stabilize at what they are. They won't fall. Well, let us see. Now, it's bad news for me because I sold my house a year ago with an expectation that I could buy in within two years and I would seriously like to see the market collapse because I got to buy one, you know, I need to get a house. But, so I'm like, you can't really trust me. I've got my own ore in the water, so to speak. But the point is we want to watch this. This is what you want to be aware of. Because there's a, you make, in your lives, you'll make a fair bit of money probably in jobs, but you'll be taxed heavily on it. The money you make on houses and the money you make in your investments will be really significant. And they depend significantly on the way the economy moves. We've had some stuff happen last month, for example, we're going to discuss. And we will look at it and go, oh my god, if somebody, if we knew this, we would know what to do under those circumstances. So this is an intensely practical thing. Okay, now, a little bit of data. So, note, there is the claim, and it's only now this huge recession, that these economists, for me, the, the market economists, governments have no role. They hadn't said a word from 2008 to 2011. They're still hiding out. Now they're creeping out and saying, oh, no, the government caused it. But basically, I can't stress enough. The issue is this. 
Do markets go to full employment equilibrium by themselves, or do they need governments to help them? And there's a two-part thing, because one is, even if they go to full employment equilibrium by themselves, it's a question of how long it takes. If it takes four years or five years, we got serious issues. So maybe the government should speed it up. But now let's just look at some of the data. And then we'll be like, you know, because I say, the question is this. I can flat out, because you know, when I did my thesis, for example, here at U of D, my thesis advisor said, which was on business cycles in Canada before 1914, just because it was a period that was easy for interesting for me to analyze. My thesis advisor said, you know, this is kind of interesting stuff, Kieran. Someday somebody might be interested in it. You know, nobody cares. Economists aren't interested in business cycles. They're interested in trends. Is the economy growing on a trend? They don't care about rises and falls. And this might seem to you, to me, this is incredible. It's like, you know, the moon is interesting to me because it has different phases and it comes back every now and then. This makes the world interesting. Business cycles are the thing for me. But really for like 90% of economists, they couldn't care less. They don't even know the issue, right? So, let's look at some data. Now, 